Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. I'm Tundu Abiola. Good morning. Welcome back. I'm Veronica Odeka. Patrick Okedenachi Utomi is a Nigerian professor of political economy and a management expert. He is a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria and a former presidential candidate. Professor Utomi is the founder of Center for Values in Leadership and the African Democratic Congress. He is a professor at Lagos Business School and has served in senior positions in government as an advisor to the late President Shagari. We also have Anselm Ojeswa, who describes himself as a lawyer in politics, who presently is the chairman of the All Progressives Congress in Edo State, south-south of Nigeria. In 1982, during the administration of President Shehu Shagari, Ojeswa was special assistant to Senator Uba Ahmed, who was the se national secretary of the National Party of Nigeria. Amstam Ojeswa has held several political positions in his native Edo state, in addition to attending to his private legal practice. These two men are here to discuss the legacies of the fo late former president, Shehu Shagari. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being here. So today we mark the end of an era. President Shehu Shagari has passed away. Last year, his vice president, Alex Ikweme, passed. How do you feel about this? What is this? Um, what is the import in today's democracy? I'm not sure. I've been following quite closely, but I don't know if anybody has raised the fact that he is the first former head of government in Nigeria to pass away in peaceful retirement. They've all either died in office or are still alive. I don't know if anybody has. That's a novel this. perspective. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, and in many ways, it goes to the nobility of the man. His dignity as a person. Um, President Shagari was a very simple but very forthright person. Um, when he was president, um, many Nigerians don't know that he was a chain smoker, actually. He never smoked in public. But he did smoke quite a bit. And he never smoked in his office. So if he wanted to smoke, he would come out of the office and come into the field in the damn barracks. I used to sit uh, and chat sometimes uh, with his chief press secretary, uh, Abba Dabo, at the time. And Abba and I sometimes would go and join him and chat. This man is full of quotable quotes, the kinds of things that I learned from him, remarkable. Uh, and yet he passed away, you know, as an easy person going. There were many outside who thought, oh, he wasn't that forceful, charismatic president. But he got more done than most who have come since him. I, I was quoted in an interview in the New York Times on the 8th of January, 1984, that Nigeria will one day wake up to the fact that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And I've not been wrong. Nigeria has been downhill since then. You know. So it's, um, it's amazing. You, you look at programs, housing. No government since him has done massive national housing the way that he did it. And he took it in his stride, easy allowing people who could think to think, and essentially giving his accent to what was right to do. And as a Democrat, you know, I mean, we see a new fascism creeping into polit politics in Nigeria. That would not have happened with the Shagari. Uh, so he made decency away, and we ought to be thankful that we had the privilege of a person like him. That's a glowing tribute, mm -hmm. Mr. Jeswa. What is your... Personal recollection of the late well, president. Uh, Prof has made it a bit uh, difficult for me because his assessment is uh, very comprehensive. So I might just uh, adopt what he has said mm -hmm. and then add that um, President Shagari had a very calming effect mm -hmm. on his environment and even the country. Mm -hmm. If you notice now, the level of negative vibes around the atmosphere did not really exist in his time. You know, he had this, um, this mantra of MPN at that time was one nation, one destiny. The idea was to emphasize the unity that we can derive, even from the diversity mm. in our country. And um, the religious, um, should I say schism that mm -hmm. exists now, it was there, but he had a way of, you know, demystifying de that. So to a very large extent, 
He, he was a statesman rather than a partisan politician. And that helped a lot in getting, uh, in getting things done politically. You could also say that because of his humility, he, he really respected that um, reality that the party was supreme. And therefore, in his time, the president was not the leader of the party. Mm -hmm. The chairman was the leader of the party. And it was respected all through the period, both in uh, the NPN and in all other parties at that time. And so the party was able to assert its authority over everybody that was sponsored by the party, including the president. Mm -hmm. So that's another very remarkable uh, attribute. I really appreciate what both of you have said today about the former president. In your opinion, what do you think that we as Nigerians can take from the way his leadership skills were when he was serving as president and now today with there being so much disarray in the way politics is held and the position of the president is held today? I think very central to the Shagari mm -hmm. disposition is the fact that public life was seen as service. You know, the man who did not care to be president, just wanted to serve his people, and was said to, you're the right man, come on. That's the way leadership is normally selected. Now you have brigands, usually cultists, terrorists, who take over political parties and then force themselves on a country. Now we are in danger of our country becoming a criminal enterprise today. It couldn't happen in his time because there was this dignity of service, of public service. That's one thing that we can and should learn from that era. Look at all the people who try to rubbish him. Look what they've turned out to be. You know, and I, I think that that lesson should be really an important one for many of us to take away about public life as service, sacrificial giving of yourself for the common good of all. That's what it should be. Do you think that we can actually get there? with the way that the country is now and with the way our leadership is ran now? Because we've had a lot of people, we've had a lot of men on our show and a lot of women that are established economists, um, in education in every sector, who speak your truth. And they tell us that this is the way Nigeria should go. But then once again, it comes back to the fact that politics will not allow, politicians in general will not allow the country to go in the direction it should. Who are these politicians? How many are they? We're entering a new 21st century slavery. We're a number of touts are holding our country hostage. And we're saying, sorry, we can't do anything about it. No, no, no. I'm actually writing a book that the most important title is, or, or chapter is The Complicit Middle. The middle is the problem. Middle class people who, instead of saying, these touts can run our country like mm -hmm. this, are on Twitter making a joke of everything. Mm -hmm. That's not the way a country is. When we were younger, we saw something wrong, and we were on the streets immediately protesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether Twitter has inoculated this generation in a way that we have no sense of outrage anymore. And this is what we really need to return to if we're going to save our country. But we've seen in cases where people have spoken out, even on social media through Twitter, and they've, you know, they've gotten into serious consequences. So, so it could be a, a case of people of fear and the security of there's no support. If you do begin to speak against what you think is wrong with Nigeria in such a way where you could actually be held accountable for your views. Who is going to do what to you? <laughs> really, tell me. I mean, we exaggerate these no, things. No, the activists who have been detained, <laughs> some have spent Christmas in detention. Hey, if it's the way that you spend Christmas, is the way you spend Christmas. <laughs> and they will be the first to spend Christmas in detention. People who have spent... One of the greatest political philosophers ever come out of this country is Fela Nikola Bukuti. He spent lots of time in detention. The people that are doing shows on his life today, the guys who detained him have paled into, paled into insignificance in history. That's what really matters. Now well, for me, mm -hmm. I don't think it is right to just generalize and just describe everybody mm -hmm. as doubts. I think that is a bit too extreme. Mm -hmm. There could be issues with our politics, yes, because mm -hmm. our politics, whether you like it or not, mm -hmm. is still young in yes. the, relative to Not the country. age of the country. And that is because we've had the unfortunate reality that we have had military uh, in office over time, 
And a lot of people have um, imbibed the attitude of that arbitrariness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have been trying to shake over time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we've had a long, this is the longest spell we've had in politics, mm -hmm. in government. And you will notice that there have been a lot of disagreements, there's a lot of talk, but there's been no, um, so to speak, serious issues. Mm -hmm. We are talking. Mm -hmm. We're negotiating, there's contestation, and that is what politics is about. My belief is that as we move on, all this will evolve, mm -hmm. and the right thing will begin to happen. So with time? Well, yes, because you see, you don't expect you send in, um, if, if the general attitude is, like you say, politicians, mm -hmm. there is no profession called politics. <laughs> it's not a profession, it's a vocation. Yes, yes it is. And therefore, People must be willing to present themselves. Yes. They must be ready to go the whole hog. Yes. It's a marathon. It's mm -hmm. not a sprint. You're not going to get uh, solutions in a matter of days or months or even years. It's going to have to be decades. Mm -hmm. But it will evolve. So long as we keep at it, we need to sustain our participation. We need to sustain our, we have to have that resolve. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people, <clears throat> like he said, he described them as touts. Not there all are, of them. Are, <laughs> not all of them. Yes, yeah, there are some of them who yes. fit that description. Yes. Mm. And there are ways and means within our system to deal mm. with people like that. We have quite a bit in Edo, and we've been dealing with it, <laughs> and successfully too, without using violence. There are laws, and they exist. There are institutions, and they exist. It's I'd just like for to, us to use them. I'd like to take it to you the know, end so, of Shagari's um, presidency. Mm -hmm. The allegations at the time were that oil prices dropped. It created economic instability. It was felt that he was too quiet and too unassuming in his demeanor to properly tackle this and to tackle the corruption of those around him, even though he himself was absolved of those allegations. And then the military took over. What do you now see with the historical perspective that we now have? How do you rate that decision of the military to take over at that time? Well, at that time, I thought it was wrong. It is still wrong today. Nigeria is worse off for it. But let's go back to the context. Um, I was living in the United States as a doctoral candidate uh, in 1980. When I came home, my father passed. And uh, at New York, at JFK, there were the display racks, Time Magazine, News, uh, Newsweek. Same, it never happened before in history, exact words for their cover title, the world over a barrel. The Iranian Revolution had, when the Shah was overthrown, led to a spiraling of oil prices. It reached, what was thought, thought of in those days, $40 a barrel. And Nigeria, earning so much money, just went totally crazy. I remember returning to the U.S. and writing a piece, an op-ed piece in one of the newspapers there, about the biggest dustbin in the world being Lagos, because we imported canned beer from everywhere in the world. Those who couldn't even pronounce their names were drinking. <laughs> and as we finished drinking, we tossed the thing out of the, the bus. So the whole place was just one huge dustbin. Everybody blocked his street to have a party. The more you could block the road, the bigger your party was and the more people were supposed to remember it. Some people poured champagne in a bucket and washed hands in it. That level of it. unbelievable, yeah. yeah. Now, obviously, one of the things that we have learned through the years is that you see that kind of spike immediately arrested by a shift in the other direction. Mm. It happened. And we did not plan well for it. That's, mm -hmm. That's, That's the key thing. Point. About the same time we're going through this, Still a small value. African country called Botswana, which had been the fastest growing economy in the world off of diamond exports mm -hmm. for more than a decade, had worked out ways, a future fund and all of that, to absorb this kind of spike in revenues. We made that mistake in Nigeria. And President Shagare began to struggle with putting a new team in place in 1983 Mm -hmm. to prevent that kind of thing from happening. So you had people like Onosodi coming into government, people like Asiodu coming into government, people like myself coming into government. I had just basically come back. Uh, I had no godfather. Mm -hmm. It was just on the strength of ideas that I had been expressing that they pulled me into government. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we had followed that learning pattern, he was a learning president. 
Nigeria would have smoothened things between 84, 85, and significant new growth would have resumed. The soldiers were impatient, and they came in. We know what history has given us since then. I think there's a fundamental issue, and I to come from what Prof was saying, planning. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that came out of military rule is this idea of going to the center, collect money. Mm -hmm. Once you pay your bills, you believe everything is fine. Yeah. And if you look at our politics, we had in MPN at the time, housing and agriculture. Those were the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. But nobody thought about power as a priority. Nobody talked about um, railroad. Though I know that Umar Rudiko was really talking about standard gauge rail, mm -hmm. and he was being frustrated at the National Assembly. And nothing could really be done about it. So all those things that had to do with vision. Yes. Hmm. So if you don't do power, and you are not into manufacturing, how can you deal with employment? How can your economy grow? These are the, and these issues are still very valid. Even now, as we speak, if we don't deal with power and we don't deal with manufacturing, which we rely on power anyway, mm -hmm. unemployment will be there. Look at 60-something percent of our you know, population yes. are youth, most of them unemployed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow up on your answer, Mr. Yeah. Jezza, but I just want to ask real quick, Professor Tommy, do you think the late President Cheo Shagari ever forgave current President Muhammadu Buhari because he was... His um, government was overthrown by President Buhari. He was imprisoned for three years. Even though he was cleared of all the corruption charges, he never, he retired from public life as a result of the overthrow and the subsequent detention. How did he feel about the current president? Well, it's not my place to, to tell. You know, I've never had a conversation with him on that subject, so it would be speculative on my part to, to try and suggest one way or the other. I think what we have learned in Nigeria, really, is that this is a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. You know, we just keep going around and coming back to the same thing. We accuse people of one thing, we do, we do worse ourselves, and then, we, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Let's determine as an elite, commit to this is our mission, the mission of our generation. And in the actions of all of us as stakeholders, ensure that whoever is there is true to the mission of a generation. Mm -hmm. That's what the challenge has been for Nigeria. Back to you, sir, Mr. Yeah. Jess, I want to take your point again. Yeah. The Shagari presidency, in realizing the economic hardships that were starting to rear its new head, decided to do this policy of exile, mass deportation, which we all term Ghana must go. Why was that? Well, how did that arise? Why was that decision made of all the possible things? Why did we blame aliens, as they were called at the time, on our economic woes? I think it was just a function of the Nigerian system. Um, the leadership was more or less like a victim of pressure from society. Again, it still brings me back to this issue of limited vision, let me put it that way. Because they did try to put a few things in place, and successfully too, some of mm -hmm. which were not even um, built upon. For instance, infrastructure for agriculture, dams and so on, irrigations. He set up all these um, river basin authorities, authorities, which are still mm -hmm. uh, around today, even though they are not really functioning the way he dreamt of it. If they were to do so, we would have achieved food security long before now, and possibly by now we'll be talking about processing, which will bring us back to manufacturing. Uh, so the truth is, if we knew what it would cost us to set up power, for instance, and proper security apparatus, mm -hmm. then we would have known that Nigeria was not a rich country. But because of our limited vision, when money comes, it's seen as bonus, and then money for the boys. The mentality, I think, is still around with us today. Mm -hmm. but. So he had a long-term vision which was never actualized. How else can you distinguish him from our current crop of leaders? Well, I think it's important to recognize that um, 
President Shagari believed in using the people around him and consulting very broadly. There is a, a tendency that came out of military rule for people to think that because they have been elected governor, they're suddenly the smartest person in town. <laughs> they, 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 they run this faith down. In fact, I believe that the governors travel with the checkbook of the states in their pockets when they're out of the country. It, it doesn't make any sense. Government is supposed to run. You're just a bird of passage. But we've created these faith dumps that have prevented progress. Uh, it's because of our own limitation, in the limited capacity of many of the people who are in public office today, that we don't build institutions, we don't uh, allow systems to be in place, we personalize power. Mm -hmm. And President Shagari was certainly not a man who personalized power. No, he wanted systems to run. That's probably why people thought he was weak. Was weak. Yeah, so yes. that's also why people, the impression is that he was not in control of his government. They he saw was. this type of leadership. But he, he, he definitely was. But he was. Yes, definitely was. The only was. thing, he didn't personalize it. Yes. So what do we say to this strong man mania that is the result of our military misadventures as a country, whereby we see power we equate power with oppression almost yes. and don't appreciate the gentleman leader, the unassuming egalitarian leader. What do you say to that? Yeah, but you can see, like I told you, I said this thing, the solution will eventually evolve. Mm -hmm. There was a time in Nigeria, because of the way our constitution is couched, mm -hmm. the two powerful people in Nigeria are the president and the governor. And like he said, it's the governors that actually make up the country. Even the president is at the mercy of the governors because the politics is local. But you can also see now that after this last activity in primaries, some governors are not happy. What does that tell you? They are not invisible. With time, as we move on, their invisibility or their visibility will begin to be more and more exposed the system will begin to, to work. It, politics is not like uh, a revolution that you can just find a solution tomorrow. Mm -mm. It has to evolve it's over a, a period evolution. of time. Yeah. But, yeah, but you know, uh, uh, President Barack Obama, uh, as President of the United States, first visit to Africa captured it all. First speech he made on African soil in Accra in Ghana is what Africa needs, strong institutions, not strong men. Uh, mm. The truth of the matter, is that one strong man wants to make sure that he is clearly different from the other strong man. So everything keeps getting reversed, and you go into this recursive mode that African economies tend to, to get into, and progress becomes less and less uh, certain. Mm -hmm. Shagari was considered too much of a gentleman, though. He, he was, and did not, and was overwhelmed or allegedly overwhelmed by powerful politicians in his government, like Alajio Marudiko, who you referred to earlier, yeah. Adisa Kinloye, and that they are the people who ended up running the government. Similar to allegations we hear today, is this true? No. Not at all. No. Absolutely. But well, that is a public perception. No. See, yeah. Okay. It, you know, the media likes to create stereotypes of everything, and so they created that stereotype. Mm. Alajio Marudiko was a very clever politician. He often made sure he was the last person to see the president and the first person to show up so that his ideas mm -hmm. were not knocked out by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't think that there was anything extraordinary about his force. Adisa Kinloe, as chairman of the party, exerted himself well, was within his due, but let nobody fool you about President Shagari not being in charge of his government. He was. I just mentioned to you a moment ago that Umaru Diko was actually frustrated. His mm -hmm. pet project yes. was the standard gauge rail. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And all he wanted was to upgrade Nigeria's railroad network. Mm -hmm. And he was frustrated. If he was so powerful, mm -hmm. I'm sure he would have just pushed it through. But that perception was created, even though it did not work in his favor yes, all the because time. because he did. was director general, I think, campaign. of the, the presidential campaign. campaign. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that made him influential, naturally, yes. Mm. But not all. Nigeria is not a country that, well, even the president cannot run the, everything all the time. It's not Do possible. you think that we can look back on um, former President Shehu Shagari's life and really appreciate it 
where we are now in Nigeria to apply to how our country should go forward and how leadership should be applied. Uh, history is 2020 vision. Mm. It always goes back. And that's why part of a council I try to offer politicians, don't think of now. Think of how history will remember you. Because history always has that benefit of reviewing things. Mm -hmm. uh, today, when history is written, Shagari will be a greater president mm -hmm. than most presidents yes. of Nigeria by far. When we're looking back, yes. As we look back. Mm -hmm. But then he was called all kinds of mm -hmm. names and all of that. But he would be a greater president than all the people mm -hmm. we are talking about who called him names, actually. Mm -hmm. So people should be a history of mind always and ask themselves, what's my legacy? How will I be remembered when people have the benefit of hindsight? That matters. Did you keep in touch with former President Sheo Shagari? I didn't. I saw him last. We went for Council of National Council of Information to Sokoto. At the time, he had really aged. He had really aged. And even when he was younger, mm -hmm. he wasn't a man of many words. Mm -hmm. He never really mm -hmm. talked was it too loud and so this time it was even quieter mm. so we really didn't have that opportunity yeah, I, I did visit him on a couple of occasions when i went to sokoto just a courtesy call like he said not too much talk he would uh, you know and i would remember some of the great council i can't talk about some of them here mm -hmm. you know those uh, smoking exchanges mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> with abadabo a few things that will ultimately come into my memoirs from mm -hmm. those, those exchanges. And so we, we, I enjoyed that. I met him a few times in Abuja when he came for Council of States meetings. And when I was uh, campaigning in 2007, I went to visit with him. Mm -hmm. And we talked about those uh, Dodan Barak's days. So, but he wasn't a man of, as he said. So. But the African proverb is, which is quite sad, that when an old man dies, a library burns down. Mm. How are some of these pithy wisdoms of his going mm. to be recorded? Yeah. Well, people like me are writing. writing a memoir. Mm. So yes. in my memoirs, mm. you, you will read some of these. Um, I, is it going to include his reaction? Did you take his? Did you take note of his reaction after he was overthrown? Those wilderness years. Are you going to include that? Uh, did he tell you? No, how no, he no, no. I didn't get to talk about that part, but I have the prison notes of Dr. Alex Akweme. Mm. Because every day, Dr. Akweme sent me notes through a war dying mm. in, in the prison. In the prison. Mm -hmm. yeah, who would put it under his cap mm. and, and come out. And, and so I have those, those notes. And, and they will be reflected in the book. Well, we'll definitely look forward to reading those yes, memos. Yes, we will mm -hmm. look forward to reading those memos. Yes, indeed. Yeah, they will now form part of our, our heritage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts? finally, on the current situation, the irony that the man who overthrew the late president, former president, Shehu Shagari, is just flagging off his own presidential campaign. And with some of the similar issues, or some of the similar allegations that he made against President Shehu Shagari, mm -hmm. a full circle Well, moment. I would tell you that, um, like I said, there's no quick fix in national or nation building. And the more we are bought, simply because we are impatient, mm -hmm. the more backward we become. If they had let Shagari alone, he would have done his second term. Another president would have come, and another one would have come. And mm -hmm. in the course of time, you can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a, a different result. Yes. I believe that by now, other people would have been coming up with other ways of getting things done. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you look at Nigeria today, you will now find that this generation of governors, a lot of them are doing things differently from what used to be. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of younger ones who will come up tomorrow who will do far greater mm -hmm. than what is happening. A time will come, you can see Lagos now. I'm not too sure Lagos borders with what allocation comes from Abuja mm -hmm. for Lagos. Mm -hmm. Because Certainly Lagos has they have established their economy. Mm -hmm. So if that is replicated around the country, this beggar, beggarly attitude of going, so if there's no allocation, there's no salary, mm -hmm. why should there be a government that does not have capacity internally to pay its own workers, not to talk of providing services? Mm -hmm. So there will be people, Nigerians, who will come up 
with a more ingenious way of getting things done. They will emerge, but not by, by a stroke of the pen. Mm -hmm. Certainly not an overnight thing. It is true that institutions evolve, we were saying, but institutions evolve as the result of the engagement of all the stakeholders in essentially defining boundaries, struggling over things and defining boundaries uh, as we go forward. My big worry, however, in taking the view that things will evolve is that the world is moving so fast right now. We're in Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. Things are going to be changing so fast that if you don't adapt quickly enough, you'll drop off the planet, mm -hmm. literally speaking. Yeah. We are poverty central. We are the capital of poverty in the world today, mm -hmm. Nigeria. If you look at all the projections, the Bill Gates Foundation uh, projects that in the next, what, 20, 30 years, between Nigeria and Congo, GDR, Democratic DRC, 40% um, of the poorest people on the planet will live in those two countries. Uh, we've seen the um, Brookings Institution study who've overtaken India as the biggest collection of the poorest people on the planet. You don't even see that urgency in political actors. It's not even on their agenda. There's such an obsession with me, myself, and I this whole narcissism, this self-love thing, that people don't understand what's going on around them. And that is going to consume all of us. Because there's no way, if we don't turn the Nigerian situation into creating a demographic dividend from the kind of youth bulge that we have, that it would not go into anarchy. And so, yes, it is important to recognize that institutions evolve. I want to be brilliant writings on that subject together by a guy called Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work. They evolve. But if we don't respond and adapt to change, you become a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much we for your time. We appreciate you both coming Thank on. You. And it's good, it's fair enough to say that based on what his legacy was, that eventually, hopefully, the traits are taken for leadership and we get there as a country as a whole. Thank you so much for coming.